Okay, good morning everybody and uh, welcome to the latest Tower Trust webinar. Uh, today the subject is uh, stigma in the social housing sector and um, I'm delighted to uh, be welcoming a, a host of, of, of guest speakers this morning to, to talk about this very topical subject. So uh, more on that in a moment, just a couple of housekeeping issues before, before we do so. Uh, firstly, uh, we're recording this morning's session just a reminder, uh, that's so that we can uh, post the session onto our YouTube channel um, within the next 24 hours. Uh, and that means that anybody who is unable to join in person today is able to catch up with that um, in their own time. Uh, we're using the Zoom webinar function as usual. Uh, it has a little bit more functionality relative to, to the normal Zoom package. Uh, the, the, Thing really to highlight is this that we've got a chat function. Um, so um, I'd invite everybody to make use of that chat function as we go through the presentations. And then there'll be opportunities to have a, a Q&A with the, with the speakers and to have a discussion about some of the things that are raised uh, as we work, work through today's, uh, today's webinar. Um, uh, there are a couple of presentations that are going to be used today, so we'll look to issue copies of, of, of presentations uh, and, and also any links where appropriate um, in the follow up email that will be issued to everybody who's, who's expressed a, uh, an interest in today's session. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce um, our guest speakers. Uh, Firstly, um, we've got uh, Mercy Donido and Amanze Ojogu. Um, Mercy is um, based at Durham University and Amanze is based at Newcastle University. Uh, and they're going to introduce um, the findings and recommendations from their most recent report into social housing stigma. Uh, some of you will um, not just remember, but will have participated in the research that was published last July, July 2021, um, where they um, issued their stigma in social stigma and social housing in England report. Um, only a, a month or so ago, uh, they um, have published um, the follow up to that, which uh, is neatly titled "Stigma and Social Housing in England: Feedback on Consultation Responses." Uh, so you should have all received um, a. Um, a link to those reports uh, in the uh, joining instructions that were issued for today's, today's session. Uh, after um, um, that uh, presentation on, on, on that piece of research, we're then going to be going, going across to um, Pam Hankinson, the uh, Secretary, and Fiona Brown, the Treasurer of the Stop Social Housing Stigma Campaign, uh, formerly known as Benefit to Society Campaign campaign. So we're delighted to, to have the four speakers um, on, to, on today's session. I'm going to be in the background. I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, I'll be on mute, but um, just as I, I'd said to uh, the speakers beforehand, I can be called in at any point um, if necessary um, as we go through. And I'll, I'll be busily thinking of, of, of questions and issues to, to discuss as we go through. So, so hopefully um, others can do that as well. So um, I think Amanze is up first, so I'm going I'm to hand over to Amanze. Welcome and thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for having us and um, I just wait for Mercy to put up slides. Yeah, thanks. Um, like you said, last year we put out the report um, Stigma and Social Housing in England and we came to one of the um, Arrow Trust webinars to, to talk about that. Um, and this is one year on now. Um, we've done a bit of extra work, and I think that's what we want to to talk about. Mercy, if you move on um, the slides um, to the next one, please. Um, so um, the the what we're talking about is the kind of project Mercy and I have been doing since maybe 2018, looking at stigma in social housing. Phase one of the project was what ended up with the with the first report and in that phase of the project what we were looking at was how social um, how stigma in social housing is constructed so how did social housing come to be stigmatized how tenants experience that stigma and what was being done to challenge the stigma 
And the first report contains our findings. You know, it talks about um, how stigma is a consequence or stigma in social housing, um, you know, comes from the kind of political narrative around um, social housing, which was kind of driven a lot by housing policy, um, trying to push welfare reforms. Um, a lot of that rhetoric was picked up by the media, and there was also significant stigma coming from the within the housing associations and other landlords. Um, in terms of st stigma also, we showed intersectionalities with other types of stigma, poverty, mental health, uh, drugs and crime. And we gave several examples of how tenants experience the stigma. Um, we, we, sh we talked a bit about things which were being done to, to challenge stigma. We talked a bit about the kind of mixed tenure approach, and we talked a bit about the work um, organizations like See the Person Now, so Stop Social Housing Stigma were doing. Um, and I think at the end of that, we, we thought instead of putting out a concrete set of um, recommendations that we would open, try to open out the discussion on stigma. So what we did was to put out a set of consultation questions, which um, basically focused on what the purpose of social housing should be, whether we should adopt a rights-based approach to, to housing, um, what can be done to stop the kind of stigmatizing narrative which the politicians and the media used, um, how we can empower tenants, so how we can um, develop this strong tenant voice to be a counterpoint to, to stigma and the kind of um, power imbalances which cause that stigma and how we can make landlords more accountable to, to tenants. So that's, those were kind of the questions we we put out to consultation. So um, I'll pass it on to Mercy now um, so that she can speak a bit about this second phase of the, um, the project, which was the consultation and what we found um, from the consultation. So. Thanks, Amaze, and thank you for having us once more. So with the uh, phase two, what we did was to conduct a consultation with key stakeholders in the housing sector. We spoke to housing providers, we spoke to advocacy group, we spoke to policy makers, councillor, politicians at the central level. We also spoke to um, 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 chairs, chairs, we spoke to tenant groups and so on. And uh, with this consultation, that was what led us to the second report titled Stigma and Social Housing in England, feedback on the consultation responses. So um, the responses that we got, we got um, incredible responses, a lot, where we got a lot from the consultation. We had 11 focus group conversations and the 11 focus group conversation cut across housing professionals, tenants group, um, housing providers, some of the housing providers, they organized uh, focus groups and some of them invited us to engage in their focus groups. We spoke to policy make at the central level. We were opportune to speak to counselors as, as well within the focus group. Within the focus group, we were opportune to speak to, uh, speak to chairs as well. And uh, four of the housing providers, they converted the co seven consultation questions into survey and sent, they sent it out to, to um, their tenants, their staff, um, their partners, and so on. So we got 149 responses from, 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 from the survey. 109 was from, from tenants. Why nine was from their partners like contractors and, and uh, police, and the remaining ones were from the staff. So we got six individual submissions from tenants as well, who they individually submitted a responses to the consultation. We got six individual submissions from housing providers. Um, we got um, three submissions from professional bodies that like um, CIH, like a uh, National Housing Federation, like a uh, National Federation for Almost, 
they submitted responses and they also, they've also published their responses. So if you want to see what they submitted, you can just go online and you should be able to assess, assess it. So we also got one from a local authority as well. So what did we find um, with the first question on what should the purpose of social housing be? Majority said social housing should be accessible to, to or it should be, it, it should be um, accessible to and should provide decent accommodation to all, regardless of their status, regardless of their financial um, levels or status, they should be able to assess social housing as long as they choose to live in social housing. And also that also has an implication for investment because the currently we don't have enough social housing stock to go around if we are pushing for such in initiative. So they talked about the need for the policy makers for um, government to invest more in, in building more um, social housing. If, to, if we have to ensure that social housing is accessible, accessible by all. Then the second question is, should access to affordable housing be recognized as fundamental human rights and who should have access to it? Um, majority of, of those respondents compared the England to that of Scotland, where in Scotland, housing is being currently being um, debated. I mean, and housing as a right is something that is a topical issue in Scotland. And it's something that policymakers, they are trying to um, look into so that it will inform uh, housing policy going forward. But in England, it's quite a, a, a different conversation. No one knows whether housing is seen as a right or not. So majority said in England, if we are looking at the English context, housing should be seen as a right. And if housing is seen as a right, it means the emphasis on home ownership will be reduced because the, the, there will be less emphasis on home ownership. Rather, if housing is seen as a right, then housing will be made available available to all, regardless of whether they choose to own their own home or whether they choose to live in, in social housing. And if housing is seen as a right, and if everyone has access to housing, the stigma around social housing would have been tackled because it's no longer home ownership, it's no longer social housing, it's housing, housing for all. And if that is the case, they also talked about the implication for housing providers in terms of providing quality accommodation. It, it, they also talked about the implication for government in terms of investing and portraying social housing as accommodation to be um, envied, to be aspired to not just a, a tenor of last resorts. So the third question and the fourth question, we found that there's an overlap between the third and the fourth question. The third question is, how can we encourage politicians to limit, to stop the use of stigmatizing language? And the fourth question is, how can we encourage the media to be more balanced and fairer in their reporting of social housing? So majority of those that responded to these two questions said, politicians, they need to set the right tone from the beginning, because most times the media, they capitalize on what the politicians, they say to, to, to stigmatize social housing tenants. So if the policymakers are able to set the right tone, then the media will, will, will not, if the policymakers are, are aware of the impact of their language, the impact of their rhetoric, then they, that will be able to, they will be able to influence the way the media they portray social housing tenants because there is a clear connection between what they say and what they, they, they publish. Also, the majority said to ensure that policymakers are aware of the impact of their rhetoric, they need to be held accountable. And holding them accountable should go beyond just challenging them and saying they need to stop. The, out, the trade bodies, uh, CIH and so on, they need to hold them accountable. They need to engage with them. They need to hold them accountable. And they need to be part and, part and parcel of the system that, that will come together to challenge stigma. Also, majority talked about the need for the housing sector to publish positive stories, not just within their organization. They need to disseminate it widely because most people, they don't know the impact of social housing or the impact social housing is having within the community. So they tend to look down on social housing. But 
if the housing sector they're able to publicize the positive stories around social housing what social housing tenants are doing that will help the media and even politi politicians to shape the, their conversation around around social housing also they talked about this the need for the sector to challenge policy makers when they are talking of going about talking about encouraging home ownership and so on and so forth they felt if, because the housing sector they've not been able to challenge policy makers around their housing policies around encouraging people to own their own home rather than investing in social housing that creates opportunity for the media to stigmatize the sector and also majority made reference to the need for the media to always refer back to um, um, the fair press for tenant guide which was put out by um, then see the person now stop social housing stigma and they should always always make reference to that to that report when in doubt of how they need to portray social housing and social housing tenants the fifth question is how can we encourage a stronger and more effective tenant voice at the local and regional level a majority felt that because there's a lack of a stronger tenant voice both at the regional the national level the policy makers they could capitalize on that to stigmatize social housing majority also said that the like the national housing federation they are not really there to provide support for tenants and that creates a gap within the regulatory system because they are there to protect the interest of the housing providers and not necessarily the interest of the tenant. So that creates a gap for tenants and tenants, they don't have a voice within the regulatory space. They don't have the opportunity to challenge policy makers. So at the national level, there needs to be a national and independent national tenant body that will speak on behalf of the tenants, represent the tenants, manage and run by the tenants. And it talked about the need to have an effective tenant voice at the local level. In this case, within the housing providers level, they felt tenants should be part of the board. Tenants should have um, a system where they can effectively engage with their housing providers. They can effectively engage in decision making. And in recognizing that, the housing providers need to recognize that tenants, without them, they, they, without the tenant, they can't do anything. They are there to protect and represent the interests of their tenant. So the, before any decisions are made, the tenants they have to be consulted. The, and the consultation needs to be impactful consultation, not just a tick box exercise consultation. It has to be impactful. And they talked about this need for the sector to adopt a collective approach to give um, tenants a meaningful and impactful voice, whether at the regional level, whether at the local level, at the national level, the entire sector, the trade bodies, the regulators, the housing provider, they need to ensure that within the regulatory space, tenants are given a voice. There is an established relationship between the regulators, the housing providers, and the tenants. So the tenant they need to have a voice. And if we are talking about voice, the government they need to support a national tenant voice to empower tenants. Uh, in the past, we've heard stories of um, the government not willing to support the, the establishment of a national tenant voice. But they felt we if if that if we are to build an effective um, housing system, the tenants should have a voice and the government should support that initiative. So um, this is question is how can we make social housing providers more accountable to tenants? Uh, majority felt within the housing uh, provider um, level, the tenants most times they are excluded from decision making, they are ignored, they are disrespected. And majority felt for us to hold them accountable, there needs to be what they call real accountability, which puts the tenants at the core of any initiative or any decision making. And the housing providers need to see the ten tenants as part of the system and not as the others. And in that, the tenant, they have to be involved in any decision making. They also talked about the need to ensure that there is a clear alignment between performance and compensation. They talked about the need to ensure that remuneration is clearly tied to service delivery in order to increase or improve on the quality of services provided by, um, by the housing provider. So there should be clear alignment between performance and compensation. 
Also, they talked about the need to have a stronger legislation to make tenants accountable to uh, and landlord accountable to their tenants. Currently, they said there is no strong accountability relationship. So the, there needs to be a regulatory system in place to enforce that initiative that will enable the housing providers to be accountable to their tenants. Also, they talked about the need for um, the landlords to be involved in their tenant forum. And from the feedback, the consultation that we had, we, we, we felt that most times, most housing associations, they have tenants forum, but they don't really understand what goes on within their tenant forum. And majority felt if they need to understand how the tenants they feel, the housing providers, they need to be part of the system. They need to attend the tenant forum meetings to understand the issues being faced by their tenant in order to provide um, an effective service to them. Also, they talked about the housing providers, the regulation, to, the need for them to impose larger fines and penalties, particularly in relation to disrepairs and so on that, because they don't have larger fines being imposed on housing providers. So majority of the housing providers, they just take things and say, oh, we, we are dealing with things, but when you look at what they are saying, it does not really match with what they are doing. So if there's larger fines and penalties in, imposed by the housing ombudsman and the social housing regulator, that will compel the housing providers to be accountable and to be responsive to their tenants. Also, the majority talked about the need to ensure that there's transparency in the way funds are used within the housing providers. And before there's any, any rate increase, tenants need to be consulted. So the last question is, how can we build a sustainable and inclusive, inclusive housing system? Majority said we need a combination of all the previous um, um, recommendations. If they are able to address them, th that should lead us in the right in the right in the, in the right direction. Also, majority also talked about the need for the tenant to take pride in their homes, and that most tenants they just trash their home. They don't take part. They talk. They talk down on their neighbors, they, they just don't care about their communities or their estate. And that brings stigma into the estate. And if that brings stigma into the estate, it's not, it's not just affecting that particular tenant, it will rub off on the others. So tenants should take pride in their homes. They also talked about the need for all agencies to collaborate in tackling stigma, particularly in tackling antisocial behavior, which is a core factor of stigma. And they talked about the need to invest in changing the call, in addressing the, in increasing the core bill of most social housing stock and ensuring that um, the external element is almost like the doors, the windows, there's no clear decision between that when they compare it to the privately owned or lease holders property, they should be the same to the stigmatized estate. And also they talked about the need to address the right to buy, that there's a need for the government, particularly in England, to withdraw the right to buy. And finally, they talked about the need to address the mission drift of most housing providers, that particularly the larger housing providers, their emphasis is on making profit rather than providing services to their social housing. So if we have to build a sustainable and inclusive social housing system, there need to be an emphasis on the social purpose of most housing providers, which is to provide quality accommodation and not necessarily to make profits. Okay, Amaze, I'll, I'll give this. Amaze, do you want to continue? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think um, just in terms of um, thinking about a way a way forward um, on stigma, um, it was good to see the the regulate the um, house committee picking up stigma and the issues around tenant voice in their inquiry on the regulation of social housing, um, which you know make some recommendations in terms of. Um, increased diversity of opinion being represented at, um, or increased diversity in terms of people they serve being represented in governance of, of housing associations um, and landlords. But also, um, Mercy, if you move on to the next slide, um, I think we need to think um, in terms of 
where do we really want to see this um, going? I think one of the things which we need to, to see is a more uh, or a better understanding of stigma. And that means a better on a localized understanding of stigma and its intersectionalities. And we need to see a more um, joined up approach to tackling not just the stigma in social housing, but the other associated um, stigmas. The thoughts around development of a tenant voice and inclusion of the tenants, um, we need to see the tenants more actively involved in regulation. So right now the co-regulatory arrangement is between landlords and the regulators. We need to see tenants input in that co-regulatory arrangement. I mean, if we go back to the past when we had inspections, there was tenant participation in inspections. So in a sense, tenants were involved in assessing whether um, service standards had been met and from a regulatory perspective. And so we need to see that kind of stronger tenant involvement in regulation. Um, we need to see a change in culture in organizations. Right now, a lot of organizations have you said, yes, stigma. We realize that there's an issue with stigma and we are dealing with it through training, EDI training and all of that. But I think there needs to be a stronger um, move within organizations to, to tackle stigma, to put, and to do that, they need to put tenants at the core of what they do. Um, right now, there's, in a sense, a crisis within the housing sector in terms of purpose. Are we, um, are we, uh, is our purpose there to make profits and to, you know, drive increased sales and, and all, of that, all of that? Or are we here to serve the tenants? So what is at the core of what we, we do? And so also the thoughts Mercy put out in terms of um, tenant participation within governance structures um, of organizations. So I think those are things we need to kind of have a more concerted push towards achieving. Um, I think, yeah, I think I've talked enough. So we'll just kind of leave it there and open it up to, to questions. I'll pass it back to Darren. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Bri brilliant, Mercy and Amanze. Thank you ever so much for that. Um, so uh, questions, there's been quite a number of questions that be coming in in, in, in the chat. Uh, I, th I was really pleased to see uh, that you highlighted the uh, the D look uh, select committee um, report, uh, which was issued over the summer, because um, it's one. Of, it was it was a report which brought together quite a number of the strands which you have been also covering in, in your report. So things like increased commercialization of the sector, uh, stigma specifically, uh, power imbalances, uh, transparency accountability of landlords representation for tenants all of those things were all things which were were also covered in in, in that report um and i i checked again this morning about the government response now i know there's been quite a lot of things going on in in government in recently but the government's response to that report was due on the 20th of september and um it, it remains overdue as as we are um uh, today uh, so it would be interesting to see um, what the what the content of that response is. So um, questions. Um, I'm going uh, sort of because there's been quite a few. I'm going to sort of bring them together. Uh, but the fir first one, which was going to I was going to um, start off with, was you, you highlighted the the different kind of groups um, of sort of individuals, organisations, and so sort of, who who um, contributed to to the research. I was just wondering whether there was kind of consensus or any disparity in views that you got from across different particular groups. So was there a big distinction, say, between landlords and tenants or, or were there other things where there was a contrast or was it just overall a strong consensus that you found across the board? I, I think um, stigma is an interesting thing. Almost everybody we spoke to said, yes, stigma is an issue. Stigma needs to be dealt with. 
uh, but the, the what they considered the issue and um, how it's dealt with that I think it, where we had the differences. And for most um, for most landlords, I think there was kind of a reduction of stigma to the kind of rhetoric, you know, communications kind of issue. So this is an issue about the way we speak, the way the way we talk, um, some behavioral issues, and so can be tackled through, you know, speaking better, communicating better, and you know, additional training. For the tenants, the issues I think um, were more they saw stigma as a more deep rooted um, issue, and you had things like accountability, you know, um, coming up, you know, this, this power imbalance and and all of that. So I think the danger we have, and this is what I try to point out when talking about the way forward, is a reduction of the stigma issues to just things around rhetoric and communication and increased training, increased professionalism. The, the issues go way, way, way deeper than that. Yeah, um, I agree, Amazi. And particularly when we look at the way when we spoke to policymakers, they, like I can recall one of the focus group, they didn't see the impact of their rhetoric on on the sector, they don't understand that the way they talk about um, encouraging housing homeownership is creating stigma. They don't see that. So the emphasis was on professionalization. That is the sector itself. They are not professional. They are not. They are disrespectful and so on. So there is clear, and we did highlight that in the report where we found the um, consensus and dissimilarities. We did highlight. We highlighted that in the report. This is what this set of people are saying about this problem, and this is what the the other set of people are saying. But we, at the core of it, they recognize that there is stigma, and we need to do something about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think so. So it's it's kind of, it's not an easy yes or no answer, is it? As a kind of, it, it it cuts across. Yeah. As is always the case with such complex complex issues. Uh, okay. Um, a couple of kind of methodological questions that we'll just go, just um, these probably take kind of these could probably address quite quite quickly. Uh, firstly, who who funded the research and and linked to that? Um, there's often issues about represent representative so how representative was the feedback that you got uh, do you think of the of the sector as a whole and, and i suppose whilst you're thinking about about that uh i guess there's we, we there's often these questions about well how representative could it be i think i think one of the things where we've we've always made a point though is is sometimes uh we we support um tenants and residents, for instance, with, with uh, particular issues around a complaint. Um, and uh, they might have experienced, for instance, terrible service, there might be very poor housing conditions. And actually that experience that they had may well um, not be representative of the landlord services more generally, but they've had a pretty rough deal from, from it. Uh, and and at, I guess there's always the point there is, is there's only so far that the social sciences can take representativeness to in that sometimes there's, there's validity in a particular individual's experience, which just isn't, accept, just isn't acceptable. And, you know, that can be taken to its logical conclusion that sometimes really poor service for a, could, could impact on people's, um, could impact on people's lives. It might be a relatively small number of people's lives, but if their state safety is compromised, it shouldn't be anybody that's that falls below those those thresholds. Um, so, um, yeah, representative. Do, do you think, um, given the the sample sizes, that that was that's reflective across the sector, or do you think it's it's always a balance, isn't it, with this research? How wide can you? Do, Get your sample sizes in order to to do that to be able to draw conclusions. Uh, as a, as academics, how do you how do you feel about that? Um, sorry, Darren, I lost the first part of the question. 
Yeah, do you, do, you, do, you, do you feel confident that you could draw firm conclusions from the representative yeah. samples that you got? I, I think when we think about research, and this is um, something, so we have qualitative and we have quantitative research. So when we talk about quantitative research and so surveys and things like that, we then the questions around representativeness, validity, and all of that that are, uh, are the right questions to ask. But when we think about qualitative research, qualitative research um, tries to answer a different set of questions, um, more around you know why things are happening or process how things are happening. And so representativeness is not the right question to, to ask there. It's whether the research is trustworthy, um, whether you know, um, there's any bias in, 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 in carrying out the research. Um, in terms of funding, research was funded by the universities, so internal funding from, from the universities. So there were no external um, funding. So in that sense, we were not beholden to any kind of funders or their agendas. Um, in, in terms of um, <coughs> the sample, yes, the sample would not be representative in terms of if we are trying to um, have every kind of, you know, every region or, you know, every kind of characteristic represented in the, in the sample, but would it give us a, a diversity of views? So in terms of diversity of views, we believe that, you know, almost every view which is uh, tenable in, in the housing space is, is shown and comes up in the research. And I think that's what qualitative research does. It highlights that diversity of, of views. Yeah, and also when you look at the focus group, the uh, focus groups group conversation that we had, it's cuts across different regions. It's not just in Durham alone. We spoke to people in Newcastle, London, Birmingham. A lot of people from all over. They attended the focus group conversation. Some of them talked about their housing provider, their estate, and so on. And when you also look at the survey, although we didn't really capture where the tenants were from, who, who, where they live, the region and so on. But when you look at the survey itself, it cuts across the key region in, in England. So from the tenants, from the housing provider, it's across the key region in, in England. So, and majority of the feedback we got, even with the focus group, that's why focus group conversation is really important because you can ask follow-up question, you go in depth and, and ask for more feedback. And if they are not sure, you probe them further. So I think from what we've done and based on the initial, reports that we did, we didn't really see any dissimilarities of views because it's like a follow-up conversation on our findings from the initial report, which to me is really consistent. I, I think the other thing to kind of note here is the nature of a consultation is it's open and then you, you really don't have control of who, over who responds to, to a consultation. Um, so you can publicize the consultation widely. You can encourage people to, to respond, but in, um, in the final you know, analysis, it's, um, you, know, you, you work with the responses you have to the consultation. And I think we had a widespread of, of responses. Yeah, okay. Um, could, N Nigel, did the, does, does, that, does that answer your question? I think, was it? No, it doesn't, Darren. So can I can I please ask, can I ask it myself in a different yeah. way? Yeah. Because essentially I understand about qualitative and quantitative research and statistical. What I'm asking here, there are two variables that I know about. One of them is the housing association size. So if you're selecting a large organization, you could get a very different set of responses from a small organization. The other thing that I acutely am aware of is demographics. So what happens maybe in the southeast and where I live in the northwest can be another variable. So you've got two obvious variables there in your data capture. So the question is not so much representation, but how statistically confident are you 
that your data capture, which is not very large, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I commend your work. It's uh, very good conclusions. I congratulate you. I'm just looking at the research itself. Uh, and, and those two variables, in my opinion, are real factors. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, in, in response to that, I think um, I'll start by saying we are talking about qualitative research in quantitative terms. Um, but that being said, um, in we did in, so in the initial research, we did go around the various um, regions, and you will see that in the report where we talk about regional variations. We also did look at large and small um, associations. So we spoke to the G15. We spoke with you know intermediate size housing associations. We spoke to smaller and even niche housing associations, so some BIM housing associations. So, so there was a spread in terms of you know, who we spoke with, both in terms of officers and, and tenants. And we spoke with ALMOs, we spoke with you know, councils. So, so there was that spread. And so we also talk about those variations. And um, again, it's not a statistical piece, so it's not a quantitative piece, and so we um, we are not talking about it in terms of variables and things like that, but rather in terms of the different views which were expressed, which is what qualitative research does. Um, yeah, and also with the consultation uh, responses as well, we got feedback from the large housing association. I can't, I can't mention their name as it's due to conflict confidential reasons, but we got responses from the large housing association. They've been in the media space, they've been criticized for disrespecting tenants and so on. And we also got feedback from the small housing association who felt they, they are doing great, they are, they are being responsive to their tenant and so on and so forth. So it's quite, and they, are, they cut across different region, London, the Midlands, the Northeast, and so on. And even with the, the, the tenants, the same thing, the feedback were from across, not just in a particular region, it was from everywhere, London, Midlands, and Northeast, and everywhere. I think one of the things which we saw, um, we again, um, partly um, because in a sense, this, the study wasn't large enough to speak to it. And I think a larger study needs to be done in that sense, was these differences in, in responses by size. And what we saw was a, large, a, a kind of disconnect between um, the landlords and tenants in the, the larger housing association. So the larger the organization grew, the larger that disconnect with communities and with tenants. Um, you know, and again, part of it is the, the power imbalance becomes stronger and stronger as the organization grows. So we did find those kind of things, but I think, you know, a larger study needs to be done to kind of speak more to that. Thanks. Thanks, Mercy and Amante. I've got, I'm, I'm aware of time. We'll need to, to move on shortly. So I'll just, I'll, I'll just kind of sum up with and, and possibly kind of have one more, one more question, which I'll kind of bring together. And that, that is uh, obviously really valuable research. I'd echo Nigel's responses about how, how valuable it is to have something in this space that, that we, that we can uh, refer to. Um, I guess the, the question I say is, 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 um, Either what's next? Um, do you have anything planned next, or is there an area which you think is ripe for further research that we really need to kind of take, see if we could take it forward? Maybe put pressure on bodies to be able to to kind of look into that into that further. Yeah, I think um, that's in relation to the national tenant voice. I think we also laid emphasis on that, that if we have to set up a national tenant voice, we need to understand how we need to set that up. We need to understand uh, the implication. We need to understand the funding source and how independent it will be. I think um, going forward to do that, because from the feedback we got, majority of those that responded to the consultation felt there needs to be a national tenant body, an autonomous national tenant body. But 
what is not clear from the consultation is how to set it up, who should fund it, how much power should be allocated to that body. I think we need an in-depth study to, to understand what should be done within that space. Yeah, absolutely. Think, we've been pushing, we've been pushing for, for something similar for, for quite some time. Um, so yeah, absolutely needed. I think two things, Darren. Um, first of all is around housing as a right. I think if we are able to push into the kind of policy space, the idea of um, adequate housing, adequate affordable housing as a right, then a lot of the issues around supply, supply of housing, social housing, you know, residualization, things like the rights to buy, a lot of those sort themselves out. The other is the the, regulate, the like, regulatory space and the tenant's position in that regulatory space. And we need to give the tenant a stronger role in regulation. And that's, I think, is the only way to sort out the power imbalance between the landlords and tenants. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant to Manze. I mean, I mean, certainly we're seeing with the, the um, Social Housing Regulation Bill and the revision to the, the, the some positive move on that, but that has to happen absolutely. And then it's about embedding it and making that real. So, uh, just in terms of housing as a right, there's certainly some themes with some of our earlier work. We had um, we did a webinar session with Amnesty International recently, who have published a report on on making housing a right. Uh, so you can see that there's quite quite so if anyone's not seen that it's on our youtube channel it's certainly something to go back to, to uh that that report um which a lot a lot a lot of uh, similar um commentary and recommendations that were included in there around, around rights to, to to housing um, i'm going to move on now and um invite um invite uh pam and fiona in and uh, so uh pam and fiona uh, so while the, they're getting ready, uh, when we did the previous session on, on stigma, there was um, so, some discussion around see the person campaign, uh, as, as it was previously known, and where things were up to. So um, we know the see the person campaign now rebranded to stop social housing stigma, uh, contributed both to Amanda and Mercy's research. And we thought it'd be a good, good opportunity as well, just to, to, to invite representatives from that campaign to, to give a more general update as well on, on, on the work of this campaign. So um, I'm going to hand over to, to Pam and Fiona now. Welcome, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Um, myself. Yeah, good morning. Um, I'm really pleased that you've invited us to speak today. Um, as, as I say, as uh, Darren has said, my name's Pam. I'm a social housing tenant. Um, I live in Doncaster, um, but my landlord is the South Yorkshire Housing Association. Um, I'm on the scrutiny group for our housing association, and I'm also a board member. Um, I feel really privileged to be on the board as um, I can put forward the challenging questions that I think that uh, tenants want to know. Um, but I'm also one of the founder members of the campaign group that started as a group of tenants coming together after the Grenfell disaster to stop the sti um, stigma about living in social housing. And as Mercy and Amanzi, we, we have collaborated on their amazing report. And um, But we are a tenant-led committee. And um, since we relaunched as... Uh, stop social housing stigma. We relaunched because um, we felt that um, saying see the person or benefit to society, um, it didn't really um, say actually what it what we're about and we are wanting to stop social housing stigma everywhere that it's found. Um, we've got many organisations, uh, housing organisations supporting us. And a number of professional bodies, including the National Housing Federation, um, the Association of Retained Council Houses, CIH, um, the National Housing Consortium, 
and shout the message, the text messaging service for anyone experiencing mental health crisis. Um, so we have got a lot of professional support as well as um, we we want tenants of, of um, everywhere to come behind us and work alongside us. Um, we have um, a small committee at the moment, um, but um, we are looking for other members of our committee. Now, I'm not going to ask any of you if you've ever encountered stigma as a social housing tenant, because most of us have in some form or another. But we've got together to form this campaign group because we believe that, as we've heard Mar Mercy and Amanzi say, and Darren, that social housing is a great asset to the, co to the country. It's valued by the 4 million households that live in it. And it does offer good rental services. And, it, and we feel that the tenants who live in it contribute to our society. Um, and we all passionately care about social housing and social housing tenants and are very proud to live in social housing. I'll just give you a small example. I've recently had a wet room fitted because my husband has become disabled. And I, I had a little few issues um, with the people that were putting it in. But once it was finished, I looked around it. And when the housing inspector came from our housing association, I said to her, do you know, I love this wet room so much that if I had paid for it myself, and I was a homeowner, I couldn't like it any better than I do now. And I think that that is something really important to know that, that it was made, it was put into my home and made to look really, really lovely. Um, so when tenants are discriminated against and looked down on because they live in the type of housing that some people feel is inferior, well, this needs to be challenged because most of us do love our homes and take care of them. I know that there's some people in every tenure that don't, but most of us do and most of us care about the place that we live. And it certainly shouldn't be seen as a stepping stone for something better. I remember being at a meeting in London when in a, an editor of a newspaper said that if we wanted the the um, media to print good news stories. Then he suggested we should focus on famous people who started their lives in social housing, but have now become successful and own their own houses. Well, why would we do that when there were so many good news stories from those of us who live in social housing? Sorry, I've tried to move my screen on. Um, uh, these are our committee, as I said at the moment. Um, as you can see, there's me and Fiona there, uh, but these are, are the, the other members of our committee. But as I said, we are looking for others. Uh, this is our vision. Um, we want to develop local awareness campaigns with landlords and tenants and support local action plans to address social housing stigma across the whole country. We are inviting residents to become resident ambassadors for our campaign, who will represent their local area and we will support them by developing an information pack so that we're all working together in the same way for the good of all tenants. Um, I know that some of you have said you prefer to be called residents. Um, and, and that's fine too. I'm happy to be called a tenant um, <laughs> and, and I'm really happy um, whatever we call ourselves as long as we're respected by everybody. Um, so we'll partner with our ambassadors in meetings to establish the support they need and then support them in meeting and running campaigns with their tenants and landlords locally. We're willing to speak at any events and tenant and landlords conferences. Um, in, in recent years, 
we've been seeing many examples of stigma that have been highlighted in the media. Um, Mercy and Amanzi um, but talked about the situation called poor doors, where in some new housing developments, where there is some social housing and own home ownership, there has been separate entrances and exits for the social housing tenants and the homeowners. This is absolutely ridiculous. We're all people who live in our homes. And in one case, it even extended to a children's play area where the children of the social housing tenants were excluded from the play area. Um, it was overturned when it was exposed in the media, but it just shows the extent of some stigma. And this is how the media see us, Benefit Street and the rubbish piled everywhere. But actually, this is the reality. Um, there, there's some lovely, lovely um, buildings. I know some people live in older buildings, but um, I moved into this um, bungalow when it was brand new. And, um, and, and I, I really, really love it. Um, so we do, we know that in the media recently, um, ITN exposed terrible conditions of water leakage and mould in the homes of tenants. And if we want to stop this, we need a plan of action. And so we really want to help um, everybody. Um, we've, we did get a, a, a meeting promised from Eddie Hughes who was the under who is the under secretary for us sleeping and homelessness? He's agreed to have a meeting with us, but of course it's been postponed because of the turmoil the government's in at the moment. We want to develop a relationship with the housing minister, but that's had to be put on the back burner for the moment. However, the chair of our group and the, our vice chair this morning are having a meeting with government civil servants. So we hope that at least they can get the message across to them. Um, so we want to get our messages um, to into the social housing quality resident panel and the building safety panels. And we want to ask MPs to voice our concerns and support our campaign through legislation. I was at a conversation only um, last week with the housing regulator and she wants to um, work towards preventing stigma as well. So we just want to ask the tenant advisory panel and everything else just to work towards stopping stigma. And so please work with us. And now I'll pass you over to Fiona. Good morning, everyone. Following on from what Pam has said, I would like to move on to tell you some of the plans that we have for the future. Like Mercy and Amanzi, we too believe the media should be held accountable for the stigma they have encouraged. We want to work with the media to eradicate the bad press and the coverage. Could you move on to some the first slide that I have, that I have, Pam. No, the one before that. No, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Slide seven, that's the one, yeah. We want to work with the media to eradicate the bad press and coverage given to social housing tenants and list some of the areas which we believe have had a negative impact from the media and which we would like to work with them to resolve. Instead of ambushing tenants and backing them into corners to get your stories, some explaining Come explaining your intentions and agenda, and agenda. That way, the tenant has more of an idea of what is 
expected. Do not take photos that reinforce stereotypes. Be respectful of who we are and take fair and honest pictures. Come looking for facts when using statistics and use them accurately and honestly, not twisting them to make a story. Don't visit our communities once. You cannot learn who we really are on just one visit. Look for positive stories. There are more of them than there are negative and they will make very good reading. The reality of social housing is the importance of having a safe, secure home. We know that, but we want the public to know too. Help us to get a TV programme commissioned. Not about people who have succeeded and left social housing, but about people who have succeeded and are living in social housing. Everyone who loves their social home and their community, community is a success story waiting to be heard. Oops, I've got my pages in the wrong order. That's about right. It just kind of got this. We already have supporters, but we need more. Our work with six existing supporters have been TPAS and the Chartered Institute of Housing, who are, we have worked with so much lately, developing our web and our series. TPAS and Northern Housing Consortium have been a great support to us as we as we have relaunched and and since as as we have spoken at conferences with them and they have allowed us to help hold stalls at their conferences. CIH helped us to initiate our web, web website, but we especially would like to um, thank South Yorkshire Housing who have helped us with further, further to um, change for the interface of our website. And they have also offered us staff support to develop our marketing strategy. Um, we'd like to thank Riverside Housing who have supported us in our search for a worker, though that hasn't quite come to fruition yet. South Yorkshire Housing Live Well who have supported us to apply for grants and funding and to develop our bid writing skills. Live West and many other organisations who have offered us support and guidance and a platform to share our ideas and campaign. But I want to make a mention to Coastline Housing who were the first to answer my begging letter and to reach out to support us. I know they were followed by more, but I want to thank them, especially for their house, their wholehearted response. I know that there are many more of you out there who feel the same and are just waiting for some of the same opportunity to support us. Our grateful thanks to go out to the, those who, for their past and continuing support to us. But as I said before, we need more. We need you to pledge us your support for our campaign. As in Mercy and Amanzi's um, findings, we believe that social housing should be a stigma-free tenure of choice with no stigma attached to this choice. It is our intent to promote this. Our action plan aims to be a strategy for social housing. It is our passion to ensure that our fellow, fellow tenants have a right to affordable homes homes which are safe, homes in a pleasant environment, to ensure that our fellow tenants have a right to a voice in the decisions made around their tenancy, a voice in the decision-making policies of their organisation, a voice in the decisions made by the government about social housing. We are looking for your support to help us to, to forward the and challenge stigma in social housing. Please consider our different memberships and ways of funding us. As you know from the introductions, my name is Fiona Brown. I'm the treasurer of Stop Social Housing Stigma. That basically means that my primary role when speaking at conferences and webinars is to sell the campaign to landlords and to tenants, to contractors and trade bodies, who we hope will sponsor the campaign and to enable us to do even more to eradicate stigma. I think that I have a pretty good job as I am doing something that I'm passionate about. Meet, meeting in person, I would usually bring my begging bowl 
and make a quip about being in a wheelchair and bringing that to look good, at, look the part. But as we are on Zoom and you can only see my head and shoulders, I'm re relying on the campaign to sell itself. Above all, we are here to break down the barriers of stigma in social housing. And the work that Mercy and Amanzi have done has highlighted what it is that we has to be done before these goals can be achieved. But what can you do to support the campaign? If you're a tenant in social housing, you could join our committee. We can have have one tenant per organisation on the committee with a further, further tenant as an associate member. There is also the option, once we've established the training, for you to become a resident ambassador in your local area. Landlords, contractors and trade bodies can become official supporters. We welcome your support in whichever form you feel able to make it. If you are able to put a stop to stigma, I will be happy. You can pledge your support by email and we'll be in touch. Email is on the slide. And you can also support us on Twitter. Do it now and we will work with you to support, to eradicate stigma once and for all. Thank you for listening. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Fiona, and also thank you, Pam, um, for, for telling us about your valuable work. Uh, I, I guess, uh, in terms of um, my my initial question, would be, uh, will if we send uh, include uh, those details which you put on the final slide um, in our uh, follow up um, materials from today's event? Uh, presumably, that's okay uh, for us to be able to um, highlight and maybe recruit additional support um, for 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 the work that you're doing. Yes. Um, you know, we certainly, you know, we value ev ev all support. I mean, I almost put on it, you know, that people should be putting their money where their mouth is, not necessarily as money, though that's really good, but as in, you know, if they really do want to eradicate stigma, then, you know, we've really got to do something about it, not just say we're going to do something about it, but do something about it. You know, there's a lot of token gestures of saying yes, we've got to, we've got to get rid of stigma, but we really have got to get rid of stigma. So as the old adage goes, it's not just about talking the talk, but walking the walk as well, and we need to make sure that it happens, don't we? And that people Definitely. get that change. Yeah. Okay, I think it's a really important, strong message for all of us today uh, to take that away. Um, I'm aware of timing, uh, so um, yeah. I think the important thing now we'll do, we're, is is to to thank all of the guest speakers that that we've had uh, today. Uh, so um, the earlier presentation from uh, Mercy and Omanze, and then more latterly from from Pam and Fiona on the Stop Social Housing uh, uh, Stigma campaign. Um, I've got a couple of updates uh, just to just to highlight before we close today. Um, firstly, uh, the political shenanigans continue, don't they, at Westminster? And um, we, I, I felt like the last sort of twelve hours or so, there's been a bit of deja vu because we've got um, uh, Michael Gove back as the Secretary of State for for housing related issues. So. Um, well, at least there's some continuity there because he was the person who introduced the, the social housing regulation bill in the first to Parliament. It was under his watch. So uh, it would be interesting to see how that develops. I'd imagine that he's probably going to want to put in uh, a new team beneath him. So we might have further changes there within within that min within the ministry. Uh, such a shame that we can't get continuity in that in in this in this area. But I suppose we've got some continuity with the return of of Michael Gove. So um, I think watch this space. Yes, Pam. Yeah, I think that's the trouble. You know that uh, every time we've arranged to um, meet with somebody, um, then they've gone and we we've, we've been left without. So it is a blessing that the civil servants have agreed to meet. Um, our chair and vice chair this morning at least they've they're meeting whether whether we get anything from them is it we we don't know 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, maybe we can maintain a dialogue on that on that front as well, uh, Pam. It'd be good if we could could assist in um, there. Okay, um, just a couple of information items as well. Uh, we've got no webinar next week, but we've got a, we've got a further webinar on the 9th of November uh, where we're going to um, be welcoming uh, Hannah Absalom, talking about innovation and the use of innovation in 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 the sector. Um, we'll then have, and this hasn't been announced yet, so this is hot off the press, but the following week, and there'll be announcements coming out in the next 24 hours on this, um, we'll be welcoming someone from the Trussell Trust uh, to come and talk about their work in relation to uh, the cost of living uh, issues um, and, and, and their work in tackling some of, the, some of that. And then on the uh, 30th of November, we're actually going to be returning to the subject of stigma, uh, whereby um, we're going to be exploring um, where some of the issues about um, methods for, for actually tackling uh, stigma uh, and, and uh, constructing that with, as, as whether, that's a, whether it's a wicked problem and what solutions might be available. Uh, so there has been some materials that have gone out for, for the innovation and the stigma wicked problems um, webinars already. So I'd encourage you, if you've not already, uh, to, to join us for, for those as well. Uh, so um, I'm going to put the virtual hands together again for our four, four speakers. Thank you very much for, for for coming today. And uh, yeah, we'll be back with our next se session uh, in two weeks on the 9th of November on, on innovation. In the meantime, um, this will be up on YouTube in the next 24 hours. Um, and uh, a big thank you to everybody who, who joined us today as well. Um, uh, I hope you found today's session as interesting and as valuable as, as I certainly did. So thank you very much to everybody and, and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.